Welcome to another circuit assembly tutorial. In this video, we'll be building an AND gate circuit that's centered around the behavior of two diodes, as well as some accessory components, namely these two momentary buttons for our first and second inputs, as well as an LED for an output. In order to convince ourselves that this circuit is in fact an AND gate, all we have to do is make sure that its input-output behavior matches its digital logic input-output table, or what's sometimes referred to as its truth table. Reading from left to right, what would we expect when the first input is low and the second input's low? Well, then we should expect the output to be low. And that's the state it's currently in. We're not pressing these buttons, so the input 1 is low, input 2 is low, and lo and behold, the output's low. We can test it against the second possibility. When input 1 is high, with our LED indicating a high state on input 1, and input 2 is low, then we should expect the output to be low as well. And in fact, it is. We can check the third possibility. We have input 1 is low, input 2 is high, then we should expect the output to be low, and it is. And in the final case, the only time in which we would expect a high output from an AND gate is when input 1 is high and input 2 is high, then we should expect a high on the output. And in fact, that's what we get. So we know that this circuit does in fact mirror the behavior encapsulated by the digital input output table associated with an AND gate. Let's take a look at the schematic. The schematic for this circuit simply reflects what we just saw on the breadboard. It has two momentary buttons to serve as our input stages and it has those two diodes as well as an LED as an output indicator. We'll follow this schematic as we build the circuit. To get started, I've just added some jumper wires to connect the left and right rails of the breadboard as well as to connect the upper rails to the lower rails on this breadboard. And I've added two normally open momentary buttons to the board. Let's look to our schematic. According to the first part of our schematic, what we need is a wire that goes from the top right hand corner of our momentary button up to VCC and we need that on both momentary buttons. Just a piece of wire that connects the top right hand corner of our first momentary button to VCC. Connects the top right hand corner of our second momentary button to VCC. The next thing we need is on the bottom left hand corner of our momentary button we need a 1K resistor connected to an LED whose cathode is pointed to ground, as well as this pull-down resistor, 1K value, to ground. And we need both of those in the same rail of the first momentary button as well as the second momentary button. Have our 1K resistor connected to the bottom left-hand leg of our momentary button. It's in this rail, and then an LED with its cathode side, the flat side, to ground. That's the first stage. They're all on the same rail. Then we need another 1K pull-down resistor in the same rail as this leg of our resistor going to our LED and on to ground. We can use a little piece of wire to make up the rest of the distance. The leg of the, both legs of these resistors are in the bottom left hand corner rail of the momentary button. And this wire just connects this leg of the resistor to ground, this resistor to the LED to ground. Now we just need to reiterate the same procedure with this button. When finished, that's what it should look like. Now that we have 
this part of the schematic taken care of and this part we can move outwards and in the same rail that our LED resistor and pull down resistor are connected to we need to run a piece of wire down on both buttons to mate with the cathode ends of two diodes. Notice I'm using a 1N5819 shock key diodes but you could just as well use a 1N4001 a standard rectifier diode or you could use something smaller like a 1N4148 small signal diode. Any of those types will work rectifier signal or shock key. And let's run these wires down and then we connect the two diodes with their cathode ends pointing toward the wires we're about to run. Just a piece of wire goes in the same rail as the ends of these, as the two legs of these resistors are, the bottom left hand corner of the button, and then we just send this wire further down the breadboard, just like that. Take our second piece of wire, hook it into the same rail as the bottom leg of, or the bottom left hand corner leg of our momentary button, hook a piece of wire into that rail and now we have our two wires down toward the other end of the breadboard. Now we can add our two diodes. Taking note of the cathode of the diode marked on this type of diode by this gray band needs to be pointed toward the orange wire. We just added. Now we need a second diode taking note of its cathode end, pointed to the second wire that we just added. Moving right along. With our diodes in place, all we have to do is finish the final leg of the circuit. We need to connect both ends of the diodes together their anodes need to be connected together by a piece of wire. Piece of wire. Connecting the anode ends of both diodes together. Then the bottom diode, the rail that it's in, we need to add a 1K resistor to VCC. But before adding that 1K, we need to add, or a 10K resistor to VCC. But before adding that, we need this 1K resistor through an LED whose cathodes pointed to ground. We need 10K to VCC. There's 10K going to the positive rail of our breadboard. And we can add a little piece of wire. Spread things out so it's easier to see. Our 1K. It's in the same rail as that piece of wire. And then our output indicator LED with its cathode pointed toward the ground rail. In this case, it's pretty easy. Short leg is the cathode, long leg is the anode. So, just need to orient it like that. And if we've done everything right, we can hook up power. I'm just using a 9 volt to 5 volt power supply, but you could just as well use a 9 volt battery, 6 volt, any of them would work. And if we've done this right, we should be able to hook it up and still match the behavior associated with an AND gate. To test the integrity of our circuit, in the first state, the output should be off when both inputs are off or low and that's this state. So that looks good. The next possibility is that input 1 could be high, input 2 is low, and our output should be low, and it is. Third possibility is that input 1 is low, input 2 is high, and our output LED is off, as we would expect. The only case in which this output LED should light up is when both input 1 and input 2 are high. And, in fact, it does. And so that lets us know that, yes, in fact, we have assembled an AND gate circuit that centers around 
the functionality of two diodes. Let's look back at the schematic and explain how that works. Understanding how this sort of circuit works is a little more challenging than understanding how, for example, something like an OR gate with using two diodes works. The easy bit is understanding, well, why does this output LED come on when both momentary buttons are pushed? That's pretty easy. You push both of these buttons, and what happens? Well, they create a path from VCC through the momentary button down to that first diode. That clamps the diode. Positive voltage applied to the cathode of the diode basically cuts that upper part of the circuit off. As soon as that button's pushed, none of that matters anymore. And then when you've pushed the second button in concert with the first, well then you've effectively clamped off the bottom diode, making this part of the circuit irrelevant. Something like that. Now you have two diodes that have positive voltage applied to them, so they're effectively not even in the circuit anymore. So you could cut it up completely like that and say, when those two momentary buttons are pushed, all that remains is VCC, 10K, 1K, green LED, ground. So of course the green LED is going to come on. The current has nowhere else to go except through that green LED, through those resistors, through the LED. That's the easy part to understand. Push the buttons, you eliminate the whole upper half of the circuit. All that remains is VCC 10K, 1K through green LED. The LED lights up, no problem. But what about all those other states? The cases where you're not pushing any either of the momentary buttons or the cases when you're just pushing one. How does that work? And first off, why would that seem problematic? <laughs> well, let's think about it. When you're not pushing these momentary buttons, you can ignore the two VCCs. They're out of the circuit. So all you're left with is this is your, the only source of positive voltage when power is applied to the circuit. Well, why doesn't it travel through the 10K, 1K, light up this green LED? Because there's a complete circuit here. VCC, 10K, 1K, LED, ground. Complete circuit. So why isn't this LED lit up when the momentary buttons aren't pushed? That's the first question. Second question is from VCC, 10K, and then you have two diodes that conduct in that direction of the arrow. So that would mean current. Then we have 5 volts on VCC. That's more than enough to overcome the 0.3 volts that it takes to turn on these Schottky diodes or the, the 0.6 to 0.7 volts that it would take to turn on a regular rectifier or signal diode. So we got plenty of voltage to turn on both of these diodes. So they'll be conducting when the circuit, when these momentary buttons are not pushed. And what does that mean? Well, that means there'll be current that flows across both of those diodes through this bottom diode up. And then we have 1K to an LED to ground. Then we have 1K to ground. And we have the same scenario in the top circuit. So when those two momentary buttons, when they're not pushed, when you're in a state like this with both of those buttons open, current should be flowing. And in fact, it is flowing. But why isn't it enough to turn on this LED, turn on that LED, or to turn on that LED? That's the question of the day. The answer to that is actually quite interesting in that it all goes back to the sort of line that you hear sometimes is, Electricity takes the path of least resistance, or current takes the path of least resistance. That is sort of a half-truth. Current and electricity, they travel everywhere, whether there's higher or lower resistance. It's a matter of less current will go where there's more resistance, typically, whereas more current will go where there is less resistance. But in this case, it's not so much about resistance as it's about something that may be akin to what physicists talk about with the notion of work. It might be better in order just to understand this sort of circuit. Now granted, this isn't 
the mathematical fancy explanation you would get in an electrical engineering class. But just in a more mechanical approach to it, the way I like to think about it is why aren't these LEDs on when neither of the momentary buttons is pushed? Simple. The voltage is here. It's got to go through the 1K. That's no question about that. Then there's this fork in the road. It can turn 1K to light an LED, which takes work. There's a, at least a 1.9 to 2 plus voltage drop to get that LED to light up to start crossing the depletion region and all of those fancy notions. At the end of the day, that takes work. Drop 2 volts means work has to be done. So the current would go through a 1K and then have to drop 2 volts. Or it can go this way through these diodes and turn them on. That's with shock keys, it's 0.3 volts. But if it was 0.6 on both of those, it would still be less than, less work, less to turn on than 2 volts for that LED. Where will the current go? It will go where there's the less work. Think of it as it's lazy. It's like a geology teacher once said, water flows downhill unless it has a pump somewhere in the stream. Well, there's no pump in this stream. So think of in the analogy of water and current, electricity, not the best. It's better to think of it as perhaps like air pressure, if you're thinking about it from a more mechanical point of view. And that's what we're doing at this point, that there's more work here for the current to do to turn on that LED, less work to turn on and have these two diodes conduct. So lazy current is going to go where it has to do the less work. So it goes through the two diodes. Then when it hits this point and this point, well, what are the options? Go through a 1K resistor, which is a linear drop, versus has to go through a 1K resistor, linear drop again, but then exponential turn on that LED. More work. Same thing here, more work to turn on those LEDs. So instead, what does it do? Well, a little current goes to that 1K in LED. You can hook up your multimeter, put it in milliamp mode or microamp mode, and you'll, and you'll end up with some micro, very likely a microamp reading on the other side of this LED. Or you could do it, perhaps better to do it, break the circuit here. Put it right there. Then see how much current's actually flowing there. I can promise you that this reading will be a whole lot less than how much is flowing between those two points. Put your meter in there, red lead here, black lead there, see what your readings are. That the lion's share of the current, because this is less work than to run down this path. It'll take this path, and it'll take this path. And that's why there's not enough left over current or voltage to turn on these LEDs when you have power hooked up here. The current travels through the 1K, the fork in the road, more work, less work. So take the two paths of less work. Another fork in the road, more work, less work. Take the less work path. That's why the LEDs are not on when the two momentary buttons are not being pressed. But what about when one of those momentary buttons is being pressed? What about when we push this button? We pushed it. Well, what happens? That effectively clamps this diode so we can ignore the whole upper part of the circuit. We could just take that out and not have to worry about it at all. Now we look and say, okay, well, where's the current going to go? When we push this button, we've created a path introducing more current into the circuit or the potential for more current, now we have VCC coming in here and VCC coming in here. At that point, where's the current going to go? It can go through this 1K, and then, or this 10K, then it's got a 1K, got work to turn on an LED, versus it can conduct through the diode, this bottom diode, less work. It's going to take the path of less work. It'll run up, then there's the fork in the road. We have this 1K versus a 1K and an LED. Well, the current coming from this VCC, the lion's share of it, some will trickle down to this LED, but the lion's share is going to conduct through the diode, come up, and then it, there is the fork. 
it could go to the 1K in the LED, or it could go to just 1K. It's going to take the path of less work through the 1K down. But then we have this new introduction of current here, this path. And so where is it going to go? Well, it runs up against, we have your 5 volts here, 5 volts here. And so it will divert off through the 1K to the LED rather than fighting against the stream coming in from the other end. 5 volts here is going to travel through the LED down. The 5 volts coming up through here is going to travel through the bottom diode up and then through this 1K down. And that's why it bypasses this LED a little bit trickles mind you some will be there current goes throughout the whole circuit but it's always about where's the most of it going where's the lion's share well just a little negligible is going down this way when the momentary buttons pushed or when it's not pushed negligible the lion's share is running through the diode dumping through this pull down 1k to ground whereas the current that's introduced when we push the button here is running up against a stream of current already coming from the bottom. And so it diverts. It goes through the 1K, through the LED. That's how you get this LED to light up while this LED is not lit up. The same explanation would apply to when we push just the, tie, the first input 1 momentary button while input 2 momentary buttons left open. There's the same sort of diversion of the streams of current is occurring. Granted, this is the mechanical, not the heavy-duty mathematical explanation of it. If you're interested in the mathematical one, that's fine, no problem. But this is just a way, a sort of lay way to think about what's happening and why these LEDs are lining up when they are and why certain ones of them are off when they're off. I hope that's helpful. If you have any questions about that explanation, like I said, it's the lay mechanical explanation, but for all purposes, it'll help you understand, at least initially, it'll prime you for the math if you want to go further. If you have any questions about this video or this explanation, please leave them in the comments. Also, if you like this video, please consider clicking like as well as subscribe to my channel. Thank you.